Hi, and welcome to Spooky Isles. My name's David Saunderson, and today we're talking to broadcaster and journalist Danny Robbins. Uh, you might know Danny, I'm sure you do. Anyone who uh, watches the Spooky Isles knows Danny. Uh, he is the host of the Battersea Poltergeist. How are you, Danny? I'm good. Hello, David. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm just looking there, and I'm just... Uh, I feel like I'm... I feel sort of... Uh, the background is familiar to us. Can you, can you explain why this background is familiar to anyone who has uh, listened to the, the BBC podcast, The Battersea Poltergeist? I, I am in the legendary shed. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think people have a lot of expectations of the shed from having listened to it. Because obviously, if you've heard Battersea Poltergeist, I spend a lot of time in the shed kind of pondering over the case and going through the evidence. I mean, previously, this back wall was kind of covered with pictures from the case like all the, all the newspaper clippings and archive and it looked at reserve resembled a kind of um you know a, a cid kind of investigation board but um it's now rather more scandy chic kind of uh tastefully painted white but um yeah it, it's a sort of pimped up shed basically i am at the bottom of my garden but um it's it's, it's a, yeah it's all right you know i've got a running machine in the back i don't know if you can i can show you that look running machine there so i can kind of okay. You know, have a little run between trying to sort of solve ghost stories. Well, it's, it's kind of a dream for any paranormal investigator to the when they're out there at night, in the middle of the night, thinking up ideas, they can go for a bit of a run. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as we said, congratulations on the Battersea podcast. I believe it actually got to number one on some of the lists around the world for podcasts. It, it did well. I mean, it was number one across the world in the fiction category, which felt like a kind of weird category to be in. But apparently, as a drama documentary podcast we get put into the drama category which is called fiction um so um yeah that was really nice that was everywhere including america and then we also hit number two overall in the uk so i, I think we, we never expected to get quite such a reaction to our story you know i mean again it was largely made in the shed at the bottom of my garden during lockdown and we sort of hoped that it would reach people and we knew that some people had liked the series i'd made before haunted and you know there was a kind of interest in a sort of slightly different way of telling ghost stories, I guess. But we never really anticipated the huge reaction it would get and the fact that it travelled all across the world and we were on breakfast TV in Australia and we had, you know, yeah. sort of people in Hollywood getting interested and all, all that kind of thing. And I think, you know, partly that was to do with capturing a moment, I think, in lockdown that we we hit this kind of sweet spot where people were cooped up in their houses, desperate for entertainment, and we just came along with this story that captured people's imaginations, I think. And and also, I think some of the things we did around the show, like having like live listen-alongs on Twitter and just kind of creating the community around the show, I think was something that people liked. It sort of felt like, you know, we built up a little club, a little community that kind of kept you company when you were in these kind of quite low lockdown moments. So I, I think that was nice. It, it captured that moment. I think people, there was just, there was a hunger for a new ghost story, I think. People were a bit tired of the same old stories. You know, we hear about Enfield a lot, and Enfield's yeah. clearly a fascinating case, but it's been made into several different incarnations on television and film and books. So I think coming along with a, a story that people didn't really know about, you know, I think even a lot of hardened paranormal enthusiasts didn't know about this story. And I think that, that excited people. Mm. It, it, it's interesting because, I mean, I feel that the way the documentary went, it almost had a feel of like Serial, the American podcast. It was like each week you had to uh, find out more about what, what what was going on and you had some really, really good people involved. How did, how did you get, you know, people like Alan Murdy and, uh, I mean, obviously James Clark, who wrote the, the, the book with uh, Shirley Hitchings, a uh, good friend of the Spooky Isles. How did you get all these people together? Well, I mean, Alan Murdy was the person who introduced me to the case. Um, I, I'd worked with him on my first series, Haunted. He was an expert on one of the episodes I did there. And um, and he just said to me, that, so this is back in, I think, maybe even 2016, I think. He said to me, I, I know about this story. And he'd been talking to Shirley a bit at that point, And he'd been going through her archive of material. And he said, I know about this story uh, you know, it's in the 1950s. It's this woman who had this incredible poltergeist activity and it was a huge in the papers and, and she's still around. She's 80 years old. Would you like to meet her? And I was like, yeah, come on. And um, he introduced me to Shirley and I you know, found out about the archive. And then I read the book that Shirley had written with James and, you know, which is a great book, uh, as you'll know if you've read it. And um, and, you know, that's where it took off from, really. So, I mean, Alan was hugely influential in bringing me to the case and then obviously you know he's somebody who's a bit of a legend of ghost hunting so Absolutely. having him involved as a consultant was really lovely to have 
Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of that, you were saying comparing it to serial, and de definitely, I was very interest, uh, interested in true crime podcasts. I, I enjoy listening to them. I was quite influenced by the style of them. I was also quite influenced by the way that they built a community around them. I, I was listening to a show called Up and Vanished, which was about a, a, a well, it was a, a girl who went missing and, and, and then was found murdered in the States. And it had become quite a big podcast. I think it sort of hit like 10 million listens or something like that. But what, what the guy making that did very successfully was that he kind of fed this interest in the case and turned everybody into an armchair sleuth, you know, so he had these um, you know, sort of updates between episodes where people could ask their questions to experts. And I, and I just really like the way that I've always liked the way that podcasts allow you to interact in a way that traditional radio, I mean, you know, you can call in traditional radio, but I think podcasts really take that and run with it. You know, it builds this community and you're part of it. And you're telling people you enjoy this podcast, not just because you like listening to it, but because it's, it's your thing, you know, you're taking part, you're contributing information to this, you're trying to solve the case. And I just thought if we could bring that to bear on a ghost story, which let's face it, you know, the best ghost stories are detective stories. They're this yep. mystery. And as a paranormal investigator, you're going in there trying to be the detective, trying to work out what's going on. So why not give it that true crime treatment? And, it, and I guess this case just really, really suited that, I think. It did. And there was there were so many facets to the Battersea Poltergeist for people to get their, I'm going to say get their teeth into, but there was just so much from the just the shocking treatment of Shirley from say like the newspapers at the time uh some of the things that happened to her in life and uh and just the fact that it was such a, a normal everyday family I believe no no and I think that makes it incredibly interesting because you know traditionally in these poltergeist cases you feel like it emanates from some sort of disturbance within the family that the family are unhappy and actually I think, I think there's a quote in Colin Wilson's poltergeist book which is um that a poltergeist never happens to a happy family. And certainly on the face of it, you know, Shirley's family are absolutely happy. And I think, you know, if you've heard the series, you, you'll see, you know, we probe a bit deeper and there are certain tensions within the family that come out later on. And I, I think, you know, the case does to some extent take on this kind of interesting quality of a detective mystery where mm. the family are all suspects in a way, not, not only as potential hoaxers, if you're a skeptic, but also as potential kind of, people who could be generating the energy that feeds a poltergeist, you know, if you're coming from a, a point of view of, of believing in, in, in that sort of idea of psychokinesis and telekinesis. And, um, but, you know, but yes, it, it's really interesting. And I, I think, you know, it also makes it feel really scary, I think, as well, because actually you look at this case and you go, well, here's Shirley, a complete, completely ordinary person, and it's happening in an ordinary house, an ordinary street. If it can happen to her, it could happen to anybody. And I think that really resonate with our audience and, and I know a lot of people sort of spoke in those terms that you know they sort of felt like Shirley was this kind of every woman figure she'd gone through this she would dealt with this in this incredibly brave stoic way you could feel that she was really frightened by it but here she was still standing still telling her story and you know that that's incredibly powerful I think and um and then you have this whole layer of the way the media treated Shirley back then and the fact that to our eyes now that that media coverage feels very sexualized and salacious and mm. brilliant and kind of really inappropriate and you know here here she is reclaiming her story you know 65 years later she's telling the story on her own terms and i think that's really powerful it is i think it's interesting it's, a lot of your stories like when you do uh, when you do the haunted podcast and and the Battersea podcast are normal people and they're not necessarily people that i would say are interested in ghosts like i, I recall one on your haunted uh, you know they were just not interested at all. It just happened to them. How, how do you feel about talking to people that are, you know, maybe don't believe in ghosts? Because I, I always find, you know, I'm, I'm, we live in a world here in Spooky Isles where everyone we talk to believes to a certain extent or at least is open to. But when you're doing your BBC stuff and you're doing different things, you're talking to the, the, the world of normals, as we would say. How does, how does it feel? talking to people do you not feel a little bit uncomfortable at times <laughs> um, this feels like a conversation about muggles and harry potter yes that's right that's exactly the what i'm what i'm talking about <laughs> um i i uh, i've also got a helicopter very helpfully hovering over me at the moment i don't know if you can hear that but um but uh <laughs> but they're listening into our conversation um but um, no, it's a really good question. I have to say that the stories that excite me the most are the ones where the person says, I don't believe in ghosts, 
but I've seen a ghost, you know, and I love that. I just absolutely love that. And I, I tend to kind of gravitate much more towards those stories than the ones where people send me a, a message and they say, like, you know, I've had these experiences throughout my life. And you know, here's sort of 10 of my most interesting experiences. Because I, I sort of feel like, you know, there are people who go out looking for ghosts and willing themselves to see ghosts. And then there are people who see ghosts and it's the last thing they want to happen to them. And then it happens. And that feels incredibly scary. It's this life changing moment. It's this moment where the person is forced to totally reassess their view of the world. And, you know, as a documentary maker, as somebody who's interested in the psychology of people, that, that moment where somebody is wrenched out of not believing and thrust into a situation where they're confronted with this thing that they were convinced is impossible. You know, that, that's brilliant. That feels like gold dust. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm very drawn towards those. And I am, um, the helicopter is literally... Well, we can't he I can't hear it. Don't worry about no, it. If they, if they, if they, they might hear us, but we can't hear The helicopter is like lowering itself into my garden at the moment. But, um, uh, but yeah, no, I, I'm just, I'm absolutely intrigued by that, really. And, and um, you know, as somebody who I would describe myself as a skeptic who wants to believe, you know, so I'm constantly looking for... Um, for evidence that there is something out there, but also constantly kind of, you know, butting up against scientific explanations of things, you know. So I, I love the stories that are resistant to scientific explanations, but I, but I love the stories that, that just happen to people who just, just do not want to believe. Yeah, and, it, and it doesn't feel, I'm not going to say fake, but these people do not have ghosts in their lives normally. They, it's not something they think about. So therefore, when it does happen, no, that's, that's yeah, and. You know, I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm told a lot of stories and sent a lot of stories, um, you know, just in general. But I, but I receive a lot of stories where people tell me about this incredibly powerful moment, you know, and, it, and it's often, you know, a childhood experience where they've seen this thing or had this experience. And, you know, nine times out of 10, I feel, well, it's probably connected to, you know, th that state of waking up, you know, the sort of hypnagogic, hypnopompic state, sleep paralysis. You know, it's it's an incredibly profound moment. And, you know not taking anything away from the moment. I mean, this is something that stays with people for like maybe 50 years, you know, and, and they always remember this and feel this shiver of fear. But it feels explainable, you know. But then there's that kind of 10% of cases where you read this story and you go like, oh my God. And then you feel that hairs rise on your neck and you think this is not easily explainable. This is not easily discountable. And th those are the ones I find myself going after. And you know, I, 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 in my time, I have absolutely loved and enjoyed the kind of programs where people run around screaming in night vision cameras, you know, and I, I absolutely embrace that world. You know, I, I kind of, you know, was a huge fan of Most Haunted when it started out. It kind of fed my interest in ghosts. But the kind of stuff that I'm interested in creating is not the kind of stuff that latches on to a little kind of, you know, tiny sound in the corner of a room or, you know, sort of story, stories of... Um, you know, haunted pubs and castles that are kind of very easily accessible on the internet. I mean, you know, I think there is absolutely a place for that, but I, I am drawn to the kind of fear of the everyday, the, the sort of horror of the mundane, the, the thing that creeps into the ordinary person's house and absolutely scares them, you know, and it's sitting within their very normal framework of their existence. You know, they, they haven't gone out looking for it. They've not turned up at the stately home or the castle or the monastery. It's just happened to them in their house. And I love working with them and trying to explain that. Yeah. Oh, you, you mentioned in one of the podcasts I was listening to, the haunted ones, and you said it was, you know, this is a, not highway men or, you know, women with heads cut off or, you know, that kind of, you know, as you just say, in castles, the, the places you're looking at are more, everyone knows a haunted castle because lots of people go to castles and they go to lots of pubs and they go to lots of your stately homes and all that kind of stuff. So lots of people, if there's anything there, they might see it. But a place like the Battersea, the only people that are ever going to see it, maybe one family in 50 years, or you, you, you did the one in Ealing where, you know, it, people only live in these places. They live in them for a long part of time. So I think the stuff you're doing is a lot more, I'm not going to say word cutting edge, but it's just more fresh. Well, it, it's really interesting. I mean, one question that people that, that comes up again and again in the emails is, have you gone to the house? Have you asked the people who live there now if they've had any experiences? You know, which is a really interesting question. And it sort of gets to the heart of, you know, whether these experiences are person generated or place generated. But I always feel like there's a real ethical dilemma about that, because if you turned up on the doorstep of someone's house mm. and you said the people who lived here five, 10, you know, 65 years ago had these experiences and were haunted, 
you just don't know what kind of people you're dealing with. I mean, that's somebody who could be incredibly traumatized by that. Mm. That's somebody who might not be able to get out of that house. You know, that if they've just bought that house, they can't just suddenly sell it because somebody turns up and says that it was haunted in the past. So I've always been very nervous about that. And I've always focused on the people willing to tell their story, mm. you know, because they, they've put themselves out there and they're prepared to tell it. But I, I know that a lot of investigators are intrigued. And, you know, loads of people said to me, oh, you know, can we go down to the Battersea house? Can we investigate? And of course, the answer is no, because it doesn't exist anymore. In, in that situation, you know, that house was knocked down in the 60s and half that road doesn't exist anymore. But um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, you know, I'd say so much paranormal investigating is about the place, isn't it? You you know, you mm. go to that place that used to be a prison, used to be a, a you know, monastery or whatever, and you investigate that place and you see what you can soak up. And I guess, you know, I suppose I'm doing the flip side to that. So I'm finding people and I'm, I'm trying to mine their experiences and trying to work out how and why they saw the ghost from them as a person, you know, yeah. and, and, and in some cases, maybe their environment absolutely fed into that, the place fed into that. But um, but it's, it's, it's certainly very person centred. It is. I've got uh, I found a uh, newspaper article about a place that's not very far from here in northwest London from the 1920s of haunting and the house is still there. And I had the same the same feeling. I'd love to go and ask them, have you seen anything? But exactly as you said, one, I think they'd probably think I was an idiot. But the other one was you wouldn't want to scare people. No, I mean, I think, you know, if somebody came to my doorstep and said that my house used to be haunted, that would plant all sorts of things in my head. Um, I mean, the power of suggestion is incredible. I, I remember hearing about a an experiment that an academic did. He, he, um, it's, um, I'm, I, I'm going to say it's Bruce Hood, I believe it is. He's an academic who wrote a book called Superstition. And um, and he does this thing where he, he has a lecture hall full of students and he asks if any of them will put on a cardigan. And he says the cardigan belonged to Fred West, the serial killer Fred West. And he asks who will put it on. And in this classroom of kind of largely sceptical people, none of them will put it on. They all feel that this object has a power to it. You know, there's some kind of talismanic, superstitious kind of evil power to this cardigan. And of course, it's not actually Fred West's cardigan. It's just a cardigan, you know. But it, but I think it's interesting that even the most sceptic people are, are, there's a kind of, there's a point where superstition kicks in with them. And I think even the most hardened people out there listening to this, if they're sceptics, you know, if you told them, you know, if you gave them a choice, you said, look, there's a, a haunted bedroom or a non-haunted bedroom, which would you rather be in? And I think they would go to the non-haunted. You know, you kind of, you know, th that power of suggestion is incredible. And if you go to someone's house, they've just moved into this house. They just bought this house. It's their lovely dream house. And you say, there used to be a ghost here. You've maybe ruined that house forevermore. You know, that's never going to leave those people's minds. I, th I, th I thought about that uh recently as well i was thinking this is going to go on holidays and it's all right to go to a haunted hotel somewhere you know somewhere like Bor near borley or something like that and stay in a place for a night but I, I don't i don't want my house to be haunted because i feel like after listening to the battersea poltergeist story it's not a good thing for people to experience I, I know i know i mean be careful what you wish for i think i, I was talking to barry dodds who you probably know, uh, yes, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who people will know from his parapod and um you know he, he was talking about how he's very much a believer and has spent his entire life wanting to see a ghost and then he told me that he actually did see a ghost whilst filming the parapod movie and it terrified him to the point where he was like barely able to walk and talk you know he was a gibbering wreck and and he absolutely said if he could undo that and go back then he would you know and you know, I, I've always been at really, really fascinated on a personal level by what would that moment feel like. And I find myself in situations like, for instance, when we did the Battersea Poltergeist, we went to 30 East Drive as part of that. And we mm. did a, a kind of a night there. And, you know, I was really willing something to happen. I was like, please, something happen, something move, something move. And then you think like, you know, at the end of it, you think, am I glad it didn't? You know, do do you want that? Do you really want that? Because... As I said earlier, it is that point where you cross over into this other territory. And, you know, yeah, I don't know. I think this is the thing about ghosts. You know, ghosts can be scary and they can be comforting. You know, ghosts, we, we as a society, we need ghosts. They sort of fulfill a very definite need for us. And, and it, there's a reason why ghost stories have essentially not changed since, you know, kind of Roman times. We have the same kind of experiences. They clearly are a way for us to process death, you know, and... Um, and, and we absolutely need ghosts. But, um, you know, they can be frightening and they can be comforting. And so this is why that ethical thing comes into play as well, because there are people I would 
want to try and help explain their ghosts away to. Like if somebody is incredibly frightened by their ghost in their house, and I feel that actually maybe there are scientific explanations for this, I would feel it was my duty to try and explain things and to help them. Mm. But, you know, we, we did an episode like this in Haunted about grief ghosts, about people seeing the ghosts of their loved ones. If the person is being brought comfort by this ghost, even if you feel that that ghost is not real, then, you know, why the hell would you want to debunk mm. that? that? That's a ghost that's playing a really important role in that person's life and helping them heal. So there are so many ethical concerns, I think, about about ghosts. And, and, it, and it's, a, it's a real spectrum, I think. And, you know, I think it, doing Battersea Poltergeist, I explored that spectrum that you have moments where it feels incredibly, incredibly frightening. But then actually, there's also moments where Shirley had this kind of connection with Donald and she was feeling this bond with him. And, and you know, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's, it's strange. It's sort of, you know, on one level, it kind of made her feel special. It made her feel chosen. And I think now she still has this strange and complicated relationship with Donald where she sort of says, you know, I, on one level, I hate him. But on another level, she felt sorry for him. And she felt sorry that there was this kind of entity, whatever we feel it was. You know, she's got her theories and other people have theirs. But she felt that it was something that was kind of trapped and unhappy and and that unhappiness was feeding into his behavior and making him destructive yeah i, I found that interesting and so it, it is an ethical question about when you are dealing with i want to say witnesses or people that are involved in sort of the, the hauntings themselves and you've got to, you've got to take into consideration their own feelings and you know how they are because sometimes you hear things and you just think that's just not right but you, you can't you can't say that at times because one it'd be rude but it just wouldn't it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the good thing to do no, uh, it, and it is a minefield, I think, because ghosts can be a smokescreen. You know, they, they, you know, you can project a ghost onto a situation. You can, you can choose to use a, a ghost as an explanation for, you know, other problems in your life, childhood trauma. You know, the people who've who've been through certain kinds of traumas will sometimes kind of bury that and process it and turn it into a ghost. I think so. So absolutely, it, it, it's difficult. I, I, I don't know. I just sort of feel like I have a kind of like. An instinct to kind of radar now that there are certain stories that people send me that kind of ring alarm bells and I sort of feel like those are stories not to pursue but you know it, it comes back to that I think it comes back to that thing about do people go looking for the ghosts or do the ghosts find them you know mm. and I, I'm, I'm interested in the people who've been found by a yeah. ghost you know um yeah yeah, I mean, you must, I mean, we get a lot of people sending our stuff in, uh, you know, ghost stories and stuff like that. But you must have had some amazing tales, considering you've been so broad in your thing. Are there any that you particularly you could mention, but you wouldn't ever want to research because they were maybe ridiculous or you know funny? Um, I mean, okay, I mean, the most ridiculous one uh, I, I had was um, a man e emailed me to say that he'd um, he'd taken off some jeans the night before gone to sleep put them on the chair the jeans had disappeared the next morning so a ghost had stolen his jeans and and it was one of those things where, where you go well that's ridiculous i mean the jeans just went somewhere didn't they? I mean, they, they you know but actually when you stop and you just think about it you go well actually how did the jeans disappear that is impossible you know like you know if you go to bed and you put your jeans on the side you know where your jeans are you're the yeah. only one in the house your jeans have literally dematerialized so it, it felt simultaneously kind of mundane ridiculous but also kind of deeply paranormal you know um, so we're not we're not gonna have the missing genes then as the, the <laughs> sequel to fantasy or but, but that's that stuck in my head but i mean i have had so many stories sent to me and so many absolutely incredible stories and i feel really privileged because actually in many cases the people are telling me this story for the you know it's the first time they've told anybody there's quite a few people who haven't felt comfortable sharing their story have been worried that they would be kind of mocked or, you know, that have their sanity questioned. And and they're telling this story because, you know, for whatever reason, the Battersea Poltergeist and Haunted have made them feel that there's a kind of certain safe space that they could share their story in. And, um, and so I think we're actually sort of now talking about putting together a, a series for the BBC where we explore some of these stories and where we kind of look at some of these real life ghost stories. Because I, I just, I, I think it's really interesting. And I think I've been asked a question a few times recently, like, are cases like the Battersea Poltergeist a thing of the past? You know, you know, uh, you know, are, are ghost stories, you know, a thing of the past? I mean, can can ghosts exist in this world of smartphones and video cameras and you know, you, you know, particularly poltergeists? You know, there's a kind of an implication in all those kind of questions that you know that they're hoaxes and you can catch them out with your smartphone. But actually, 
I feel like there are a lot of these cases out there and people just don't feel comfortable talking about them. We used to feel more comfortable sharing these stories. You know, we used to, you know, we, we weren't ridiculed if we said we felt there was a ghost in our house. And I think the narrative has shifted and people feel less comfortable and less tolerated kind of talking about that. So I'm really interested in that and exploring that. And I, I feel like I've got a lot of cases now that are really, really interesting. Quite a few poltergeist cases as well that are coming out and that I really want to explore. So that's that's kind of territory I'm going into. Well, that's good. Well, Evelyn, who we, Evelyn, who was one of your experts that uh, in the Battersea podcast, we spoke to her about a month or so ago, and she indicated there was going to be another, or well, possibly another long series. Is that, is that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, we, we just, you know, we, I really enjoyed doing that format. I loved the drama documentary format. I thought it was such an interesting way. I mean, the, the drama literally allowed me to bring the dead back to life you know I could I could yeah. you know in a way I guess it's it's like creating your own archive you know normally in the documentary you want this archive video or audio of people speaking we didn't have that in the Battersea case because it was so long ago in the 50s that you know that just people weren't being recorded in that way so so to use drama to bring the original haunting to life was just this great device and I think you know to, to, to do another case like that really excites me and so yeah we are we are currently working on um, on a new case, a new investigation, and using that kind of style. So, okay. so watch well, watch this space. <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Now, more exciting because it's not very far away. It's only in August. You've got a a play coming, and I think it's called Twenty Twenty Two. It's called uh, Two Twenty Two. Yeah, Two Twenty Two. Sorry, Two Twenty Two. Sorry, it's, it's a time, the time of the clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us about that? A, a ghost story. It's called. Yeah. Um, Lest there be any confusion about what's Sorry, in. sorry. I was thinking, uh, I don't know why I was thinking. But uh, no, no, 222, no, 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 a ghost story. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, it, it's a play I've been working on for quite a long time. I've been working on it for about, I'm going to say, five years, I think, actually. And, and it's something very close to my heart. And actually, weirdly, it's sort of, you know, in a kind of chicken leg way, it's sort of, it is the thing that inspired Haunted, actually. I, I had this idea for a play, and it was. It came from this inspiration of I was talking to a friend of mine. She told me that she'd seen a ghost and um, and and I don't know, I guess it just it really surprised me. She she was somebody. I mean, I don't know if there is a there's not a type of person who sees a ghost, but I, I don't know. For whatever reason, I didn't think that she would be the kind of person to see a ghost. And she told me about this ghost story and it was incredible. It made this incredibly profound effect on me. It was a, a very frightening and unsettling story of what had happened to her. And. And I was just interested because I felt like, you know, I absolutely believed her story, but I felt there were a lot of people in our friendship circle who wouldn't believe the story. And um, and I wondered how it would change people's opinions of her. And I just was interested in if you put that into the context of a relationship and you had somebody who had seen a ghost or believed there was a ghost in the house and somebody who resolutely didn't and was incredibly sceptic, what would that do to your relationship? You know, how, you know, basically how can you love someone if you don't believe them, you know, I guess was the starting point. And so that's what it's about. It's about this couple and they have their friends who are around doing this housewarming dinner. The woman member of the couple believes the house is haunted and the, and the husband doesn't. He's this kind of very, very sort of skeptical, rational person. And, um, and then over the night, it's this kind of build to 222, the moment that the ghost appears each night. Uh, to see if it will appear and to see what impact that will have on their relationship. And, and there's a lot of frills and spills and dark secrets that emerge along the way. It's a properly kind of, you know, it is a kind of properly scary night at the theatre. It's a real ghost story. And um, and so anyway, you know, but whilst I was researching this, uh, I was asking people, have you seen a ghost? You know, can you tell me your ghost story? And I was getting all these amazing ghost stories coming in. And I was like, hold on, this isn't just research for my play. I need to do something with this. So that's what haunted, that spawned haunted. Haunted was out of, that research so it feels really weird coming back to the play now having done haunted having done you know haunted spawn battersea poltergeist i've gone and done these things but now i'm coming back to the thing that started it all which is lovely and um and we've got this amazing director matthew dunster who did hang men in the west end and and so many amazing productions in the west end and really excitingly we've got this great great cast we've got lily allen making her yeah. uh, um, acting debut which is kind of mind-blowing and jake wood who people will know as max branding from eastenders who, who you know who, really exciting actor coming back to theater after doing eastenders for so long hadley fraser who's this amazing musical star who also is this fantastic actor in straight theater as well and and um 
and you know brilliant to have him and 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 Julia Chan as well who who is really exciting you know maybe not as well known to a kind of British audience but has done some amazing telly stuff recently and just you know this fantastic quartet of actors that I couldn't be more overjoyed to have on board no no it's it's very exciting and uh, especially as you say with Lily Allen you know doing her debut there it's going to be interesting for lots of people how long has it been in the in the process for because obviously it's been a bit well not funny it's been a dreadful time for theatre in London uh, over the last 18 months uh, when did this project start well, I mean, you know, I started writing it five years ago. And I mean, I think someone once said to me, it takes about three years to get a play on from, you know, having a commission to staging it. And so I, I'm running a bit behind schedule on that. But it's, it, it does, it takes a long time, basically. And COVID hasn't helped. You know, I think there was a point just before COVID kicked off where we were hopeful it might, something might happen with it. And then, you know, thankfully, it's it's kind of coming back now um, as one of the kind of first wave of things coming back after the, the closure of theatres. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's been a long process. It's been several years and, um, you know, and I'm still slightly holding, you know, crossing my fingers that COVID doesn't, you know, kind of further kibosh it. You just don't know, you know, it still feels an uncertain future. But um, yeah, I mean, it just it just feels brilliant. And I'm, I'm so happy that, you know, the idea of people sitting together and sharing in something. And I feel like in a way, I feel like the ghost story is the perfect thing to come back to. You know, I feel like after after this horrible period of COVID, we just need something really cathartic. And, you know, what is more cathartic than sitting with your mates, feeling a bit scared, having the occasional scream, you know. Um, uh, I feel like it's a, it's a good way back into the theatre. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think. I was, there's been quite a few, or I've been a couple of really good uh, sort of horror type, I would say horror ghosty type of plays in the West End. You've had Ghost Stories, mm, which mm. was magnificent. And then you also had The, the Woman in Black. <laughs> How do they compare? I'm not going to say obviously are they as good, but but you know what I mean. Is it is it a similar type of experience? Yeah, I mean, I mean they're they're both great. Obviously, I mean, you know, I, I you know absolutely loved both of those watching them. I mean, I think you know anything that can genuinely make you scared in the theatre is 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 brilliant. I mean, that, that's not an easy job, I think. And and you know, I think um, they they are both great examples. I mean, I, I think ours is ours is you know it's interesting. It's quite different. It's a psychological thriller. Um, but it's come, coming from a very more kind of realistic point of view, I guess. You know, it is this these two couples in a house that will feel familiar that might look like your house, you know. And um, and it's, again, I suppose it kind of taps into the kind of stuff that I'm interested in in Haunted, that kind of, you know, the, the, the terror of the mundane, the, the kind of ordinary house, ordinary people, and then the very extraordinary experience. So it, it comes from that so it, it it it's kind of different you know woman in black is very much the, your classic ghost story it's got that brilliant kind of classic ghost story setting it's a period piece you know ghost stories is a kind of anthology piece obviously um th- this is this is very real and very believable and for me that that makes it very scary you know i've always felt like the more real something feels the, the more we identify with the people telling the story then the more that that creeps the hell out of us <laughs> so basically the the what we take away from this is that you you feel that the the more normal something is the scarier it is i i for me yeah i mean i i just feel like that that really connects with me i i sort of i i you know the relatability of it you know the the i guess i i, I don't get scared by you know the the, the kind of phantom highwayman or the the kind of you know, the, the, the idea of a, a monk passing through a wall. I mean, I, I, I probably would if I was confronted by it, but mm. it's just, yeah, I, I guess I, I, the thing that helps me believe, the thing that helps me go that extra distance is, is the, 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 the relatability of that experience to mine. I sort of feel like if I can kind of understand it in terms of how I would feel, like, you know, this thing, you know, this object flying across my living room or, you know, this kind of figure appearing in my room, then that that's what, Gives me the added scare factor, I think. Yeah. I, th- I think that's right. So anyway, thank you very much, Danny. It's been wonderful talking to you today. And uh, I really do look forward to uh, whatever new project that you come up with, uh, you know, Battersea Poltergeist 2 or the, you know, that series. And obviously we'll be looking very forward. I'm not sure how I feel about going into the theatre yet. I'm probably a bit, I'm probably more, I'm more scared of that than I am would be. The I know, of the I know. Well, that, that is, that's the great leap of faith, isn't it? I mean, you know, I think... Um, Hopefully, by the time we open, you know, things will will feel even safer, you know, but um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. So I'll, you know, I'll, I'll 
I'll be brave and I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll go and check out uh, two twenty two a ghost story by Danny Robbins. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, David.